Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jane Robinson. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor of Engagement and Place at um, Newcastle University, and it's my very great privilege to welcome you all to tonight's Inside virtual in conversation event and we are absolutely delighted to be joined by Darren Henley chief executive of the Arts Council England uh, Darren has very kindly to agree to respond to questions that we've received from across the region and there'll also be an opportunity for you to submit your questions for Darren throughout the event and we'll get through as many as we can you can submit your questions via um, the YouTube live chat box on your screen or via Twitter at Insights NCL. And if you are tweeting about the event this evening and want to share your thoughts, please do use the hashtag Insights NCL. So um, to introduce uh, Darren, um, Dr. Darren Henley, OBE, is Chief Executive of Arts Council England. His experience spans many different areas from the arts, media, education, charity and, and government. He led Classic FM for 15 years before joining the Arts Council in 2015 and is the author of two independent government reviews into music and cultural education. And he received the British Academy President's Medal for his contributions to music education, music research and the arts. And Darren recently um, published um, a, a book, um, The Arts Dividend, Why Investment in Culture Pays, which I think is a really important focus on um, the public investment in arts and culture. So Darren, welcome. We're delighted to have you uh, here this evening. Good evening, Jane, and thank you very much for having me. I'm very really sorry not to be with you in person, but next time. Absolutely. We look forward to that. So as I say, we, um, we, we've asked for uh, people from across the region to um, ask questions that they would like to have put to you this evening, uh, Darren. And, and not surprisingly, a number of people have reflected on the challenges um, facing the sector coming through uh, COVID-19. And we know that the last 18 months have been like no other for, for everybody. Um, but the sector has been hit particularly hard. And I just wanted to open the discussion uh, this evening with a question from Ian Watson, who's uh, recently retired as the role of director of Tyne and Weir um, Archives and Museums. And Ian's question is, is really reflecting that since 2010, many arts and cultural organisations have changed their business model to increase traded income through increasing footfall. But COVID has really highlighted the risk of that reliance on increased footfall and, and really wanting to get your views on, on how um, the pandemic and the future will, will be in terms of business models that are sustainable for cultural organisations. Well, I, I think the first thing I would say is, you know, to echo what you said, how absolutely devastating and challenging it has been for organisations and for individuals who work across the arts, museums, libraries over the last 18 months. I know it's been really tough for absolutely everybody and, uh, you know, in, in, in all of our lives we've had challenges, but uh, it has been particularly bad for the sector. I don't think when you when you go back 18 months, that, that, that thought that organisations would have to close their doors, uh, not be able to sell tickets, not have visitors, not have participants. Uh, there would be no traded income from 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 uh, shops or restaurants or bars. You know, none of us had really imagined that then going on for for such a sustained uh, period of time. So, uh, the one thing I would say is that the you know the the value of first the Arts Council's uh, emergency recovery fund and then uh, the government's cultural uh, recovery fund has been absolutely ma massive in terms of getting our sector uh, uh, making sure that it's still alive now uh, and getting it back on its feet again. I mean, I think we, we you know we have worked uh, a lot to say that um, the best organisations have got a mixed economic model. You know, some of it will be around selling tickets, or uh, some of it will be around earned income from from bars or shops or, 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 or restaurants, or from letting out space, uh, from 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 providing services to other people. Uh, and I think going forward, we have to continue with that because actually that creates. Uh, a model which I know was particularly tough, but this is particularly an exceptional set of circumstances. And that's why I think, you know, you did see the Arts Council first and then the government step in because the circumstances were so exceptional. But um, 
going forward, we've got to retain that mixed model. Um, I think the alternative would be that, that there will be an over-reliance uh, on, on public funding and, and you know, the, the call on the public purse now is great. So we have to find new ways and different ways of, of, of working. And I should say the, the other part that has been very important and we will need to, to continue to grow back up is the philanthropy model as well. You know, that's always been part of our sector uh, too. Um, I think we have a, a great model here in, in, in England. Um, you know, if you go to continental Europe, uh, you see a model which is, is slightly more reliant on state support. If you go across the Atlantic, you see a model which is uh, slightly more reliant on philanthropic support. Actually, we've got a good model there. Uh, the public sector, um, you know, pub, the taxpayers and national lottery players essentially stepped up to the plate to uh, make that investment over the last 18 months. I think we will we'll continue now to have uh, a period where we will have change. We know it's going to be tough as we trade our way out of this. And, you know, we're, we're hopeful that, uh, you know, uh, fingers crossed that the, the COVID situation doesn't worsen and that we can trade as near normally as possible or getting back towards normal as possible. But it is going to be tough, and I do acknowledge that, but we, we're going to need to have that mixed model going forward. I think one of the things that we, we have heard from people is that actually there are, you know, although it's slow in, in coming back for some of the venue based activities um, some of the um, outdoor and open air um, uh, activities and festivals and so on um, have seen a, a good good pickup over, over recent months yeah and i think you know it's really important that uh, we create a safe environment both for the workforce so for people working inside in buildings or outside uh, and also for, for, for customers who are, who are paying and buying tickets in one way or another so we uh, we need to uh, to balance that all the time but um you know we'll follow the government's advice we'll follow the scientists advice and uh, you know we'll do whatever we can to to make uh, um all of our environments as safe as possible for everybody but you're right we've seen some outdoor stuff uh, become very strong and work very very well you know all of the, the the data and the scientific evidence that was gathered by dcms through that process to understand how we could uh, open as safely as possible has been fed into the system uh, and you know i'm now out and about and going into auditoriums and i think people are being responsible and, and you know they're using the hand sanitizer they're wearing masks they're they're, 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 they're being responsible for themselves and for other people and i think that's to be encouraged and, and I think the other thing that we've seen quite a lot of is, is a number of um, artists and arts organisations really sort of seeing what the opportunities are around um, online and digital engagement as, as well. And uh, I, I mean, you, what are your reflections on, on, on whether that, that is something that we're going to see as an increasing trend? And, and if so, you know, what are the ways to help generate income uh, around that kind of digital offer? I think we learned a lot over 18 months in terms of the digital offer. Uh, and one thing I would say just in terms of the physical space as well, I am very mindful uh, of those people who, uh, through no fault of their own, because they have particular conditions that means they have to shield or they have particular disabilities that makes it tougher for them to go back in real life. And we, we've got to be very mindful uh, of those individuals and making sure that there are opportunities for them uh, wherever we possibly can. To, to engage with live in-person art. But uh, if that isn't possible for whatever reason, then actually digital also offers um, a, a service to, 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 to those individuals as well. But I think we learned a lot um, and we saw uh, some organizations move into the digital space who'd not been there before. And there was a big learning curve there. But I think one, the things we have learned is that high quality content, uh, unique content, content that you couldn't necessarily see because of geography. So something that was on in Newcastle tonight that, uh, you know, some of the other end of the country in Cornwall would never be able to get to normally, they actually could share with that and, and can see that. And it's also opened up international markets. So some of our organisations have been able to become international brands or bigger international brands. And I think that's exciting. For me, going forward now, I think it's always going to be a mix of the two. I think, um, you know, we, we, we're we probably not, for most organisations, going to go 100% digital, but also we want that physical experience. There's something about being human beings, about being in a place with other people, uh, enjoying some sort of artistic endeavour, whether it's a performance or, or seeing something in a gallery or a museum. It, there's something about that that, that is, is, is very, very special. Uh, where it's safe to do that, we want to keep doing that. Digital, though, offers all these other opportunities. I think the, the one thing I would say is it's got to be high quality digital going forward. And we've learned some of the things that don't work over the last 18 months as well. And, and so we need to move away from those and move to, to the best possible experiences for people. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I couldn't agree with you more about actually that sort of, you know, 
that frisson of excitement of having that live experience of uh, of, of interacting directly and uh, you know I think thinking about the kind of mix and how we kind of get the the, the best quality in in, in both uh, uh, in both settings. There's a question that's sort of come in around I think building on the points you're making about learning from one another and 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 sort of what you see as the opportunity of cultural organisations um, and an artist really partnering to to share experiences and and, and learn and, and maybe work together in terms of coming coming through the impact of the pandemic well i think you know um, one of the interesting positives that might have come out of this is is, is you know teams and zoom and actually people from different parts of the country being able to come together and have a conversation and i know there's a lot of groups that now take place that sort of are carrying on uh, as we reopen everywhere that we're, 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 we've been running for the last 18 months where groups of artists or particular art forms or specialisms have come together and had conversations and I, I think there's a lot of learning one of the things i've always been very lucky about working for the arts council is that you know um, i get to travel around the country i get to see uh, a lot of different work and meet a lot of people who make that work meet a lot of audiences too um and um so i can see what's happening around different parts of the country i'm always worry if the wheel is being reinvented simultaneously and just people never got the chance to talk to each other about it whereas actually we know that great creative processes build on each other so i think one of the things that can happen because of that digital uh, connections that people now have is that that uh, that building can go forward in, in a more uh, a more joined up way thank you and um there's a question from the audience about whether um, there are particular parts of the sector that have been more resilient than others. Um, but I'm, I'm also mindful that we, we have another, another uh, question that was asked in advance around the impact on freelancers and um, uh, sort of individual creative practitioners and who I think sometimes there's a bit of a feeling kind of fell between stools in terms of some of the support that was available. So what's your reflection? Are there parts of the sector that, that have been more resilient and, and kind of how, what's your reflection on the impact of, of, of the freelancers and, and, and individual artists? Well, should I take the two questions separately? And just, just on the resilience question, um, uh, look, I think we, we, we're really lucky. We work with amazing creative people. And there were some, some in, enormous challenges that they faced over the last 18 months. And because they're amazing creative people, they thought their way out of it very creatively. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, and so new things have happened and right across the sector from, from uh, small arts organisations to big uh, uh, venue based arts organisations, museums, libraries. Everybody's had to do things differently and they've done things for, for, for their own organisation to make it work as best it could, but also knowing their own audiences as well. And I think that's really, really important. So there wasn't a one size fits all. Different people in different places have done different things. Uh, and I think that's really exciting because those organisations have done that to my mind, are the ones that are actually going to have a, a deeper relationship with the people in their place. Uh, and I think that's really, really important. To take the freelancers question, uh, I absolutely understand the challenges that, that, um, that freelancers have, have, have faced. And, you know, as a sector, we have a higher percentage of freelance uh, employees, workers, than the, the, the many sectors do. And it has been really, really tough. I think the, the, the thing that I'm hopeful for now is that as uh, organizations are reopening then more work is being commissioned uh, and we're seeing that revenue stream come come back through into freelancers um from, from our point of view at the arts council we, we, we're really interested in what more we can do in the future to have a deeper relationship with individuals uh, wh whether that be uh, creative practitioners of one form or another uh, um, or, or, or curators or you know and I'm, when i say creative practitioners i mean everybody uh, dancers, um, uh, actors, musicians, directors, writers, producers, uh, and, and anybody I've missed out now, I'm not doing it deliberately, you know, everybody who makes those those creative uh, inputs. And we, we, we're thinking very hard about that. The one thing we did do was in our, our initial emergency response fund, we had an individual uh, fund uh, there. Also, we've really uh, grown Develop Your Creative Practice, uh, which is a, a, a fund aimed at individuals to help them uh, develop their creative practice with a, with a grant of up to ten thousand pounds so so that's you know we we, we took that budget up um, a huge amount uh, over over that period and uh, the you know the uh number of direct grants we've made to individuals it, it runs into the tens of thousands over the last year 
Thank you. And I suppose just building on that, a, a question that we received from um, Jenny Richards, who's actually the director of um, Newcastle University's Humanities Research Institute, really focusing on, I, I guess, that kind of experience of individual artists. So um, many artists having to rely on low paid part time jobs. But even with this income, their, uh, uh, their income is often lower than the national living wage. Um, there's an organisation, I don't know if you're familiar with it, Strike a Light, which has promoted a scheme to support artists on a salary of £27,000 a year to allow them simply to focus on their creative practice. And, and Jenny's question is, is, with this in mind, would you think of what do you think of employing artists full time without planned outcomes? And is it something you could see happening more in the future? Well, I think we've got to look at all sorts of ways of funding things in, in, in the future. And there are, there will be lots of different models. And I, 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 I know there are some people who are thinking about instead of having uh, associate artists who, who are on freelance, they, they bring them in for a period of time uh, on a salary. And I think organisations are thinking about that. But it, but it is very clear that the, the, the people who create the work are absolutely central to what we do. So we've got to make sure that they're supported. I do believe very strongly that people should be able to build a career working in, in, in the cultural sector. And that's really, really important. Uh, you know, and, and there's a lot of conversation uh, around uh, studying humanities or, or arts based subjects at, at university. Uh, I think it's a really important thing. I think it's very, very valuable to us as a country. I think it's, you know, the fact that the, the, the government um, came in and invested nearly, nearly two billion pounds across the UK in our cultural sector shows the value of it. Uh, it's, it's, it's important because um, it, uh, it's important in itself for that creativity. It's important because there's a huge amount that the arts and culture does to make us uh, lead happier and healthier lives. It, it's defining for places and it's really important for us uh, on the international stage as well. So I think all of those things are important, but there is also something, you know, it's just, it is really important that we have the opportunity across this country to create great art because uh, I, I, I talk about what, what makes me get up in the morning uh, and my three words are creating happier lives. I think that's what we do at the Arts Council. Um, we, uh, we, we invest taxpayers and national lottery players money in organisations and individuals across the country who, who help create happier lives for other people. Uh, and so for me, uh, that's the reason why, and we can't do any of this without artists or curators or, or people who run libraries. I mean, I, th I think it's interesting that question and around the, you know, the importance of um, that sort of pathway around developing skills for the creative sector, but also more widely kind of the importance of creativity. And, and I know this is something that, that you've put a lot of emphasis in the Let's Create Arts Council strategy and, and uh, the Arts Council's recently launched um, the new um, uh, creativity collaboratives. Um, and, and we did have a question from Diane Fishanela, um, who leads creativity, culture and education um, around um, really sort of your, your thinking about the importance of creativity and education more widely um, and, and how, you know, you've referenced this yourself, but the, the, that kind of, you know, the emphasis that we hear from government on STEM so important but actually part of has to be linked into the, those wider um those wider skills um that we get from creative education just wondered if you could sort of reflect a little bit uh on on, on that area well for me it's very simple uh, a, a creative education sorry a, a good solid education uh, has three parts numeracy literacy and creativity and I, I you know i'm not sitting here saying that we don't want our young people to be numerate or literate of course we do but we want them to be creative as well and i don't think um, there's quite often uh, strikes me a lot of the things that i come across when we have conversations about the Arts Council externally about the things that we're interested in. People uh, make very binary choices. But so for me, actually, yes, you can have a knowledge based education that learns facts and figures and, and, and uh, is, is very strong on that. But you can also be very creative on it as well and have a, a part of it can be very, very creative. And I think creativity and having a creative education in the classroom is really, really important. I think it's actually something that every child should have. I'm also very interested in uh, what we can do uh, for early years as well, because I, I very much sense that um, for those young people from tougher socioeconomic backgrounds who may not have the opportunities that other young people have, uh, what they learn in that naught to five age range uh, is really, really important. And one of the things we're doing, uh, working with De Montfort University in Leicester, we have a programme called Talent 25. When I came into the Arts Council, I, it struck me that 
real people don't really live their lives in one year or three year or five year spending cycles. Uh, they live their lives. So I was really curious just about what we could do over a 25 year period to understand the interventions that you can make into a young person's life uh, with arts and culture uh, to, to improve their opportunities and, and the outcomes that they can have. So we're doing that work. Uh, we have our, our first sort of cohorts uh, who are sort of naught years old and one years old at the moment, and then we'll keep building up and we'll stay with them for the first quarter of a century of their lives and learning all the way. Uh, and I think that's really, really interesting because when you look at parents of a, uh, of a child who, who comes from a background where there might be a little bit of money, where they can make some choices, where they are sort of culturally aware and they see that as an important part of their young person's upbringing, you sort of, I, I was very interested in what, what are they actually doing? And they're probably making a series of interventions in that young person's life. Um, uh, you know, do you want to play the piano? If you don't like the piano, you can uh, play the violin. Uh, do you want to, uh, I'll read you some books in the evening, we'll go to the museum at the weekend, uh, we'll pay for, for drama classes. That's fine if you've got that money, but if you haven't, then we're really interested in what those interventions do so we can better make the case. And it's, you know, we've chosen to do it over 25 years because it's beyond anybody's political cycle or anything like that. It's about saying, let's really get that long form data so we can understand once and for all what that effect is. I believe it makes a massive effect. I suspect many of the people uh, listening to this also believe that. We've got strong anecdotal evidence, but sometimes we've never had that data. So having that data is really powerful for us. Thank you. Well, we'll come back to some um, questions around data, data in a moment. But I, I think really interested in this sort of notion of, uh, I suppose, wider access to um, culture, creativity, and how we sort of make sure that um, we're supporting um, sort of that that wider um, diversity, really, in the sector and, and benefiting from, from the sector. Uh, I mean, from the Arts Council's point of view, ha ha how are you working to sort of make sure that that there is that sort of those that opportunity for all i mean i know arts for all was certainly and arts for everyone has been a, a bit of a, a strap line how, how how are you seeing that as being something that you can drive forward in the, in the next phase of the arts council strategy well let's create it is very clear that we we want people to have an opportunity to be creative where they are to be able to be participating in, in work but also to have the very best work being made where they are and being brought to them where they are as well. So, so geographical spread is really, really important and investing across the country. For me, we've always been, I've always been very clear, we're an arts council for the whole of England. I'm not someone who has believed in sitting behind a desk uh, in London all the time, you know, up until 18, well, 18 months ago when I was locked away in my back bedroom for 18 months, um, I've been spending every half of every week uh, working outside of London and travelling around the country, meeting the people that make the art, meeting the audiences, seeing the work. Uh, and I'm back doing that again now. So so that's actually uh, uh, really, really important to me. Um, uh, so we, we, will, we do want to spend more money in more places uh, for more people across the country. That's really important. I think at the heart of Let's Create as well, it is that sense of... Uh, of, of access to, 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 to art and to uh, culture and to museums and libraries, uh, to, to spaces and to people and to ideas. Um, I think it's also uh, about um, people being able to participate and take part, uh, whether as uh, audiences or actually as makers. Uh, and I think it's also uh, about social mobility as well, which is really important. You know, we want to make sure that the people who make the decisions in the future sitting around the top tables in this country are representative of the whole uh, of England. And I'm not sure that's the case at the moment. We've got a journey to do with that. Uh, but I'm very, very strongly believing we should do that and go on that journey. I, and I think that is certainly something that that we, we've sort of seen that sense of, you know, particularly um, during the the um, coming through the pandemic and movements like Black Lives Matter, where we're really sort of, I think, having to um, think very carefully about our approaches um, to diversity and understanding of different cultures and how we can actually see um, those differences as as opportunities to bring people together rather than to drive, drive them apart. But uh, I mean, in terms of sort of reflecting on the experiences that we've, we've seen both in this country and, and across the globe um, linked to that sort of Black Lives Matter movement, how, how, are you, how do you see um, the arts playing a role in relation to all of that? Well, I think it's really important that we recognise that um, it hasn't been right always uh, and we've got to do more uh, to make sure that uh, 
you know, we, we have organizations that have all forms of diversity, ethnic diversity, we, uh, we, we, we have gone some way on a journey on, but there's not much more to do. Uh, actually, we're, we're, we're shockingly bad as a sector in terms of, uh, of disabled artists and disabilities. Uh, and uh, we talk about it a lot and we, we, we don't do enough on that. We need to do more. Um, I also think uh, geographical spread is really important uh, as well to make sure we're investing across the country. And also um, uh, there is uh, still a job we've got to do in terms of social mobility as well. So make sure that the people who are working in the arts and culture have the opportunities from all backgrounds to actually rise to the highest level. Uh, and it's not about who you know or about how much money you have. Um, and that's really important uh, or where you live even. Um, and uh, so I, I think that, that that is there. But we learned a lot from Black Lives Matter uh, and we challenged ourselves a lot. And I think we're still in that process of asking ourselves those tough questions and making sure that everything that we do for is representative for people right across England from all backgrounds. I think, you know, there's, there's a moral argument for that, which is really, really important. Um, there's a business argument for it as well. Uh, actually, why, why on earth wouldn't we want to be work to create creative products that people actually want to connect with from all communities? That's, that's really important. Uh, and I think there's actually a very pure creative argument as well, because, you know, for me, creativity happens when you bring people from different backgrounds with different life experiences and you bring them together in a safe environment that means that they can create really good new uh, work together they can think new thoughts they can do new things and that's where we get innovation that's where you know by bringing them together we, we get that really amazing creative spark that uh, nobody you know can sit there and legislate for it nobody can write a budget or a business plan for it it's that moment when you bring those people together and then you know you've got the magic happening <laughs> Uh, you, you've talked quite a bit about the importance of that reach across the whole of the country for, for, for the Arts Council. And, um, and and we've had some questions come in from the audience about um, how the Arts Council is supporting um, all sorts of communities, um, whether that, you know, obviously um, there's a sort of a sense of an, and a big agenda for government around leveling, leveling up. So it'd be interesting to get a view on, on what the Arts Council's and your take on leveling up is and, and, and what that might mean in terms of perhaps those communities outside of the big cities, the, the places like Bly, the, uh, uh, the places that are, are not necessarily in in the cities but beyond so uh, what does leveling up mean for uh, for the arts council well one of the things we've announced just in the last few weeks we've got 54 new priority places so um and I, i've been visiting some of them the last few weeks so uh, i was in cumbria i went to, to baron Furness and whitehaven so um to, to, to actually very different places but, but, but both of them uh, places where we would like to to develop uh, a bigger cultural infrastructure. For us at the Arts Council, we've learned a lot from our Creative People and Places um, programme. So, um, you know, uh, Northumberland Museum's Bait uh, is, a, is a good example. You know, you were talking about, you know, use Bly as an example there in, in Ashington and, and uh, Bedlington and Newbiggin by the Sea. Uh, you've got you've got the work that they're, they're doing there based in a, in a former mine, based at the museum. Uh, and actually the, the principle of Creative People and Places it, it is about, it actually started very much as a, as, a, as, a, as a research project as well as anything else. And it's actually about co-curation. It's about working in those places that in the past have probably not had as much investment as they should. They may not have the arts infrastructure as they could, but you've got amazing people there who are very creative, just as creative as anywhere else. And I always say, you know, talent is everywhere and opportunity isn't. We need to put the opportunity in, work with those people. Again, not telling them what they ought to have, but helping them to, to, to be co-curators of the work. Sure, we sometimes show them what they could have, but we allow them uh, to, to, to make those choices. And you've got that network of, uh, of programmes across the country now uh, that's really starting to make a, a difference, is really uh, embedded in the community just down the road from where you are, you've also got in Sunderland is another example of, of where it's uh, with Cultural Spring, where it's worked incredibly well and, and is, is an absolutely central to changing the story of people in those places and and showing them uh, that actually uh, uh, they can be really really strong creative beings just as much as anybody else and i want them to be much more demanding of us as well so one of the things is is they build a relationship with the arts council and over time they can can then demand more of us and, and they're, they're quite right to do that I, I i think that's absolutely right and and i i guess the um you talked earlier about the um, that sometimes there's a bit of a binary, and I, and I think um, the idea of a, a binary between sort of cities and towns and coastal places is equally kind of um, 
erroneous in the sense that actually successful places, successful regions do also need successful cities. And I wanted to kind of come back to a question that we received from Jim Maudsley um, from Newcastle City Council. So I have behind me the uh, tower of the Civic Centre. Um, so we're just sitting here in, in, in Newcastle um, and some fantastic cultural venues here. But the question from Jim was really focused on um, you know, the way in which many towns and cities are having to really think differently about their high streets. You know, the pandemic has accelerated trends and changes on, on high streets. So, but we do know that um, culture uh, and can play an incredible role in terms of regenerating and reshaping places. So um, uh, Jim's question was whether the Arts Council will be looking to Treasury to help ensure that we can uh, deliver on that transformation in cities like Newcastle. Well, I'm always very happy to have conversations with Treasury to show them good evidence as to why they should be investing more in arts and culture. And I think, you know, really interesting because many of the uh, schemes the government have actually announced um, where local authorities have bid into them do have cultural projects absolutely at their hearts so and not necessarily coming through the Arts Council, but some of those other town based or, or, or city or region based schemes. I mean, the, the one thing I'd say to, to everybody who works in local authorities is we know how tough it's been for them and some of the really tough financial decisions that they're having to make. Uh, and, uh, you know, local authorities remain our biggest partner, uh, whether it be big cities or, or, or more, more more rural uh, local authorities. And, and uh, it is true. It's really, really interesting, the work and the thinking that's now being done around towns and, and, and cities, but towns particularly, um, where I was talking to one chief executive a, a few weeks ago of a, of a local authority, and um, she was saying to me that, um, in the old days, they would have wanted uh, a multiple department store in the centre uh, and maybe then uh, some of those multiple chain uh, cafes and restaurants that you, you would see maybe with, uh, around some of the cinemas and things like that you get and they would wanted those in their city centre and that would have been a good, good or a town centre, that would have been a good good result. That's not what, 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 what they want anymore. So for many of them now, a cultural anchor of some sort is really, really important. So it could be a museum, it could be a library, it could be a gallery, it could be a performance space, it could be a mixed use art centre, but they're really interested in different places will come uh, with with different models. Uh, I mean, I suppose, you know, if you go to, to uh, South Tyneside, you've got the word there, which, you know, absolutely as, as, a, as a big library built, uh, you know, a magnificent building built, uh, you know, one end of the town, you've got Customs House the other end in South Shields. And and, and so you, you've you've got something there which actually are two anchor institutions. Um, and what people are then saying to me is that it, now it's quite interesting what what use can uh, artists make of other spaces, in, in, you know, which might have been shops at one stage or even offices. So there's something there because artists fill spaces, they, 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 they make things and that's interesting. I think also, um, what can we do to, uh, to to convert some parts of the centre to make them somewhere where artists can live and work? And we're seeing that starting to happen around the country as well. You know, artists are a good thing in uh, places that they, they make them vibrant, they make them creative, they, they literally animate them. I mean, literally animate them. And uh, and I think some of those things are really, really exciting. So I'm having a lot of conversations where I'm hearing chief executives of local authorities saying something I don't think they'd have been saying a decade ago. And I think... Um, the really exciting thing is culture, cultural people and cultural organisations will be at the centre of how uh, our towns and cities look going forward, you know, in, in the decades to come. And we're probably just at the beginning of that. I suspect what's happened over the last 18 months has actually uh, uh, made that a more rapid process. Yeah, and I, I, I think that's certainly some of the conversations that, that we've had with, with partners in the city about the opportunities that, that will be there in the future. And, and I think just looking looking to the future, so Chris, crystal ball time, um, uh, really a, a question from, um, from Paul Watson, who's the director of the National Innovation Centre for Data. Um, you mentioned data uh, earlier, and, um, uh, and, and, and Paul's question is that many organisations are drowning in data but they struggle to extract value from it. And um, there's a view from the National Innovation Centre for Data that they want to work more with arts organisations. So he would like to ask what your thoughts were on um, data-related opportunities for cultural organisations. 
well, we'd love to work more with him. So that, that that's that, so at least you know, we should have a conversation. Um, but uh, we now have for the first time in the last year appointed our, our first chief data officer. Uh, and that's something that's really important for us. And that's not about, uh, I think one of the things we've got to do is to make sure we're gathering the right data uh, and also then that we know how to use it. And we're, done, we're gathering that data for a reason. Um, and, and so I think that's a, that's a challenge for us as an organization, but a challenge for all of the organizations uh, we work with. I think data is so important in helping us to make the case, uh, particularly when we're in a challenging period of, 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 of public finances. Uh, you know, for example, I, I'm always told that people who build uh, road junctions have excellent data that, that they can run against why they should be able to build that road junction and what, what it will do in terms of saving lives or improving the journey time or, or creating a, a different uh, spend at a, a certain retail environment or, or in terms of tourism. So all of those things that I think are quite important. We, we've got to be very clear that we have that data to be able to make the case. I think it's also really interesting There's a creative thing that's really interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by how organizations like Netflix or Amazon use data to curate creative products, you know, and, and whether that be uh, the sort of picture that you might see on, on the thumb, thumbnail on your of Netflix screen. If you like certain sorts of things, they might bring one particular picture out and they might use something else. And so they're then also using that data to research the creative process. And they're then actually spending large amounts of money on creating uh, TV shows uh, or, or long form TV shows, they're investing in high quality TV because they know that that's content that their audiences want. So I think there's a lot there that, that we can unpick. Um, and it's so it's it's data to help us run our businesses more effectively. Uh, it's data to help us show the case for why we're wise recipients of taxpayers and national lottery players money. And I think it's also data that actually helps inform our creative experience as well. So data is really important. Well, hopefully that's something that we can um, we can take forward. It was interesting mentioning um, the likes of Amazon and, and Net Netflix. And um, uh, um, sadly, I think earlier this week we saw the death of, of Jerry Robinson, a previous chairman of the, the of the Arts Council. But one of the things that um, I think Jerry Robinson really um, put quite a lot of focus on was the opportunities, I suppose, about what you would call sort of um, entrepreneurialism and, uh, and and working in partnership between the arts and um, uh, and, and business. Is, is, is that something that you see as a kind of a future trend where there are opportunities? Yeah, I think we've got to take opportunities um, wherever we can and we've got to seize those opportunities. Uh, I, I think there's a lot that uh, we in, in the publicly funded arts sector can learn from business, but I think there's also a lot we can also teach business as well. And I think, you know, uh, br bringing those two together can be, be really, really interesting. We're really interested, are there uh, different funding models, new ways of investing in, in arts organisations and cultural organisations that, that might make them more resilient, sustainable over the long run? Uh, grants will still all, almost certainly be part of what we do forever, but uh, at the same time, there may be other ways that we can invest in things. We now, as part of the Cultural Recovery Fund, have a loan book, so some of those bigger organisations have now got loans and, and that was right for them as part of this process so we're really interested about how we might do uh, different things particularly uh, if if, um, if we've got more call on our money uh, and uh, uh, we want to make sure it go as far and as, as effectively as possible I mean, we're certainly um, seeing um, in uh, in the northeast and, and in, in Tees Valley the uh, the combined authorities, the mayoral authorities, identifying culture and creative industries as a key part of the future economy, um, and uh, you know, and and investing in supporting the skills and the business in infrastructure. Um, is that is that something that the Arts Council would be uh, would see as part of your your remit? Yeah, well, we see ourselves as a national agency for creativity. So we work with lots of people and, and you know, we do invest in a lot of digital content. I think it's it's also uh, really interesting when you talk to artists now or creators now, they don't necessarily see themselves as working in one particular art form. Uh, and certainly I, I, I'm sure you find this in when I talk to university students, you know, particularly those doing uh, very creative practice based degrees, they can find it slightly off putting because they might be doing some sound work, they might be doing something visual, uh, they might be doing something includes uh, actors or dancers or music, music and actually they're, they're, they're very multidisciplinary in what they do they're also multidisciplinary in in their means of distribution as well so uh you know they'll use different technologies uh and some of it will be live and in, in, in what we you know traditional performance spaces but some of it will be very radically different i think that 
that's important. And I think it is important that we do uh, stay very open and alive to, to working with all sorts of other investors as well and, and different businesses uh, and different ways of working. There are also practices we could we can bring in from some of those uh, organizations as well, which are, are interesting. But, but I, I think the one thing I would say is uh, we work in a sector where we have some of the best entrepreneurs. And, and you know, I absolutely reject uh, any idea that people have sometimes of saying, you know, the, the cultural sector it has a second class set of people running their businesses or people with ideas or working in an entrepreneurial way. I, sim- I think that's simply not the case. We have some of the best. And actually, there's a lot that people could learn from the people who run our organizations and also make the content within them. So, I mean, we, we've talked a little bit about the sort of some of the technologies, the, the, the data. Um, what do you see as some of the other main trends that we might see um, yeah, in the sector in, in, in the next 10 years or so? Well, I'm really keen still, and you touched on this early on, to make sure that we are a sector that is as open to as many people as possible and and, and widening that participation, widening that access, having that greater geographical spread uh, uh, centres of production excellence across the country, I think is really, really important. Uh, I think, you know, one of the things we've, we've seen, and we touched on this again with technology, is that we have that international stage now, uh, and we can use technology uh, to uh, to connect with audiences around the world. And that, that idea of, of a global audience, I think, is really, really important. Um, uh, but it all, actually is important once, you know, we get to a stage where international travel is back on, that actually, we can actually get people out on the road, on the planes, on the trains around the world again, which, you know, is, is a particular challenge at the moment in terms of international touring. And we're very, very aware of that. But when it's safe to do it, uh, and the challenge at the moment with it, of course, is each country, each territory around the world has a different set of rules and regulations that are COVID related at the moment. And that's that's really tough. And also they're very changeable for obvious reasons. So uh, we really recognise that that's a challenge. In the meantime, um, you know, the, the work that can be done digitally uh, does offer some exciting opportunities there too. So I, I think for me, the, the the key thing is that we've got to be open to new ways of doing things and new ideas. Uh, I think that's why we have a uh, uh, reputation around the world for, for the, the quality of the work across so many different art forms, so many different genres in this country. Um, th- and that's because actually we, we, we are prepared to think differently and to do it in a different way. And, and, and we're not scared of that. And that's, that's, a, that's a really positive thing. There's a specific question that's come in from the audience about how the Arts Council um, supports international um, partnerships and and the benefits that you see from that. Yeah, we're very we're very interested in that, and we're talking already to the Department of International Trade, and, and we, we we continue to talk to them. And, and obviously, uh, uh, it, once we exited the European Union, we, we've we've got to stage them where we need to build new relationships around the world. And we've been doing some work with places like South by Southwest in Austin, Texas. We've got a partnership with developing in Germany at the moment. And, and there's there's work going on all, all the time in that area. We have an international team who are working on that. It's been a little bit slower than you would expect for obvious reasons because we hadn't factored COVID in. I think post-COVID, we're, we're very, very keen to see that work grow. Uh, and we know we need to support people. I think the other interesting thing that's really come home to me in terms of uh, producers who are putting on work internationally is the time it takes to develop the relationship, to make that initial conversation where you might go out there to a country and talk to somebody to actually getting your product into into that place. That's a long time. We, we're very interested about how we can support that process because we recognise that the, 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 the long-term benefits are very great, but there's short-term challenges in just getting to the stage of, of, of getting to, to being able to trade properly, to create the work and to actually get out there. Uh, and that's in normal times. It's even harder at the moment. And, and, and you, you, you referenced this um, as you were, were talking about the international um, partnerships. And we've got a question that's come in around climate change, uh, you know, and there's always that tension in terms of um, global travel and, and the impact on the climate. And in the context of, of COP26, which I think is on many people's minds in, 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 in the coming weeks, what, what do you see as the role of arts and, and culture in terms of climate action? Well, uh- I think, you know, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, COVID maybe gave us all a bit of a jolt and showed, showed us that, that nature, um, uh, you know, biology um, actually uh, is something that can control us. And, and we, 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 you know, it's bigger than us and the earth is bigger than us and the climate climate changes is, is you know, if, if COVID was a, was, was a big wave, this is, this is really, really more, much more significant. So it's, it is so urgent uh, and it's so important. And uh, it's something that the Arts Council 
we, we see an increasing focus on. We've, we've done some work with Julie's Bicycle over the last few years, and actually, uh, this is, you know, I'm, this is not me just blowing our own trumpet, but we are genuinely seen by other arts councils around the world as leading the way in terms of working with our organisations to help them to be as uh, environmentally sustainable uh, as, pos as we possibly can. And we, we, we've done a lot of work around uh, 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 reducing carbon emissions. Uh, we've done a lot of work around understanding how we can make our organisations as sustainable as they can be. And Julie's Bicycle has been absolutely central to that. And, we, you know, we, we'll be doing more work um, with them uh, in future months. And we'll be talking more about the things we've got coming up around COP26 uh, as well. But uh, I think there's also a job for us to do and for artists and arts organisations to do in terms of the work they commission in this area that helps us to have the conversations, that tells a story, that challenges people, that makes them think in a different way. Uh, you know, and I think that's, that's important too. We need to look at making sure, uh, you know, there is a balance and we, we do want to be able to take, you know, artists and work around the world, but we also do want to do that in a very sustainable way as well. And, and to ask those questions about how can we make it uh, as green as we possibly can. And, you know, even for us and, uh, as an organization, what can we do uh, around reducing travel or around uh, making our, our offices as, as environmentally sustainable as possible? You know, when you, when you, when you make a, a decision to move to a new office, for example, are we really challenging ourselves all the time uh, to make sure that building is, is, is as environmentally uh, sound as it might be? All of those things are important. They're all little things, but actually together they add up. And I think as a sector, if we actually did all of those little things and we all did them regularly and really consciously, we could make a big difference. Yeah, I, I mean, I think certainly um, uh, here in the Northeast, through the Northeast Cultural Partnership, we have a, a number of organisations that are coming together to to explore exactly that kind of the, the role that uh, um, organizations and creative practitioners can have in terms of um, uh, addressing that climate challenge and I think it is certainly something that is high on on, on many people's agendas uh, kind of turning to some other other challenges you know uh, in, in in many ways um one of the things that um COVID I think has really highlighted is is um challenges around health and health inequalities and and I think um a, on a previous uh, forum you talked about um the role that culture played during the pandemic in terms of the, the the nation's well-being and 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 I think that you know there has been quite a lot of focus on are there ways of thinking about some of those challenges around health inequalities and the role that um, culture and arts can play around our health and wider wider well-being definitely and I think this is a really important growth area and it's one you know you asked about what we might be doing in the future and i think this is something we will do more of in the future um social prescribing um has, has become a really interesting part of uh, of the work that many doctors and organizations across the nhs nhs commission clinical commissioners are doing we we've uh, co-funded with the department of health the uh, national academy of social prescribing so we've got that work happening now and i think it's a it's a more and more important area for us many of our organizations uh, are, are starting to work in this area and many artists are developing their practice in this area. I think one of the things we've got to do is uh, when we're doing something for, with, with a medical outcome, we've got to be very clear that we work with clinical commissioners and that they'll be looking for something that has, has a very positive, measurable uh, medical uh, or health-based outcome and we shouldn't be afraid of that that's that's really important we we shouldn't overclaim as well we can't fix everything uh, but there are things that we can do really effectively uh, i'm particularly interested in the work that, that's being done around around people's mental health and i think some of those mental health challenges we've seen come through over the last 18 months are very real and very important and, and, and for, for people can be very debilitating uh, i'm particularly also interested in, in in what we can do around young people's mental health i know you know many universities and schools are, are, are really really working a lot on this and i think there's something there that the that, that, that artists art creative practice um creative places um museums libraries all of them have have a role to play uh, how we can develop that is really, really important and, and for me you know, I, I talk a lot about, I've become very interested in positive psychology and um, we talk a lot about uh, uh, the outcomes that people can have around, around living happier lives and actually if you're healthier you will live a happier life and, and so, so that's really really important to me. So for us at the Arts Council we see that as central to, to, to what we do going forward. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I think that sort of um, notion of, of um, the link between health and happiness is, is a really, really interesting one. One of the questions that's come up from the audience, which I think is, is really um, salient to this, is, and you touched on sort of social prescribing, often those uh, activities are supported by relatively small community arts groups um, and um, there is I think a, a, a question that that's been raised around how can um, how can we really support the resilience of those small grassroots community arts organizations well I, I think again it's not for me it's never a binary question I'd like those organizations to, to, to be able to grow I think the work they're doing is really really important and we need to make sure that you know and I also think it's a, I'm very very clear on the idea of the quality question just because of the size of your ticket price or, or, or your international reputation does not make the art that you produce necessarily um, uh, a higher quality than the art that's being produced in a village hall uh, there will be great art produced in village halls and probably some not so great art sometimes and on internationally renowned stages there will be great art performed and sometimes not so great art performed and I think you know that, that that's the interesting thing it's it's not binary uh, what we want to do is identify excellent practice wherever it is and invest in that and that's what we want we want we do want excellence we do want uh, high quality work but we also recognize that will look different in different contexts and it will be different in different ways so and will be measured in different ways as well so you know in a community arts organization with a health-based project then the data that we'll be catching will possibly be on health outcomes because that will be really really important uh, so there's lots of questions around that but uh, it, it's a really important area again that link we've got, and I talked about mental health, but there's some great uh, examples around physical health as well. So for older people, uh, who, uh, dancing and falls, uh, actually, if you dance, uh, your likelihood of falling is uh, is much less. Uh, your lower body strength uh, is improved. Really good data to show that's the case. Really good uh, investment. So that, that's a sort of investment that we can point to and say, if you're a clinical commissioner, have you considered this? And I think, as you were saying earlier, one of the, the challenges around that evidence base is um, those longitudinal um, studies that enable you to be able to map those, in, uh, those impacts over a long period of time, because these are often changes that, 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 that take, take some time. Um, can I pick up then, because um, I suspect this might be one, uh, that one of the questions that's come in from the audience is around um, the what do you typically see as the the challenges you face when you are persuading other partners of, of the value and this is coming back to your book i think that the, the arts dividend so in your conversations with governments with uh, local uh, local local authority chief executives uh, uh, and and other partners um what, what do you typically come across as the uh, as the challenges that you need to overcome in convincing them of the the, the value of investing in arts and culture well, sometimes people don't, if they don't have the direct experience of it themselves, um, they don't know the stories. So some of the things that I think is really, really important is um, is actually to turn those challenges into opportunities uh, and to make it relevant to those places. So when I'm going around the country, I always ask people, you know, what do you want to be famous for in our part of the world here? You know, what is it that you really want to be famous for? So for us as an investor, um, that, makes, um, that makes it easier for us to understand what the ask is. We can't give everything to everybody everywhere simultaneously because there simply is enough money. So so, so I'm really interested in that and developing that narrative and that story. So I think stories are really, really powerful. Um, and, and what's interesting is when, when I talk to people in places, they have a story about their place and then suddenly you can see how artists or a cultural organisation, a museum, a library, and all, a, a, a space of some sort of building or, or just actually flooding the streets at certain times with creative people doing things, um, that can be part of that story and that can start to build it. And when they see that and they see how that works maybe in other places, uh, they think, yeah, I'd like a bit of that. And, uh, and then we can start that journey. And so actually having important, it's really important to have uh, leadership on the ground and that, that can come from all sorts of interest in different places. It's not necessarily hierarchical leadership, uh, leadership on the ground that makes a massive uh, difference. I mean, I was in uh, Nosley uh, last week where they're building uh, the new uh, Playhouse, Shakespeare Playhouse of the North, you know, and the local authority absolutely behind that, that, that and, you know, have, have been 
you know, steadfast in their support of it. Really interesting. Prescott Town Centre is now changing. There's some really nice uh, new um, uh, restaurants that have opened. It's much more of a destination. They changed the street scene working with Historic England. There's some really interesting stuff. Again, they're changing the story of that place. So that's what makes it exciting for me. So I, I don't see challenges. I always just see opportunities. And, and I suppose uh, uh, just sort of building on that sort of place-based theme, I, I suppose it would be remiss of me not to ask what you see as the kind of role and potential of universities in working in partnership uh, uh, on these agendas. Well, um, I'm, I'm genuinely glad you asked it because I, I'm a big fan of universities. I, I think, uh, and I don't you know, work in the university sector, but I think they are so important as institutions up and down this country. And I think also it's really important that we have different sorts of universities and actually in the northeast you've got a great example with the five universities there they're, they all do different things and they they, they work very well uh, in a very complementary way together and increasingly work as, as a team as well uh, i think that's that's really really important so i think universities are, are vital because they train the next generation of our creative practitioners really really important uh, and, and and you know the work that they do uh, in that sector in, in, in building the skills for our sector should never be underestimated we shouldn't forget the research work that's doing so so you know universities are doing the thinking and and, and imagining and, and inventing and that's affecting us uh, in a very positive way across the cultural sector whether it be technological advances or or, or new ways of uh, of delivering or creating work or, or just new work uh, and then also there's that place-based role that universities have uh, which is absolutely vital and i suppose maybe 10 20 years ago certainly before i was at the arts council the partnership in a place might have been between the arts council uh, a group of artists and arts organisations, cultural organisations, and the local authority, and it was kind of a triangle. I now see it very much as a square, an equal four-sided uh, shape, where universities are absolutely central to that. I mean, Newcastle is a, is a, is a brilliant example of that in terms of, uh, of the work that you do, in terms of the, the training, the learning, but also uh, hosting uh, major arts organisations, but also investing in, in, in all sorts of creative work for the benefit of the people who work for you, for your students, but also for local people as well. And I think, you know, the really interesting thing is, why wouldn't you do that? You, you know, Newcastle being a vibrant, exciting city, which it is, is really, really important for you as a university. But Sounds like um, a, a good, good, good place to end. So um, I, I think we've, we've pretty much um, run out of um, time for questions. Um, so um, we'll have to um, uh, call it uh, at the end of the event now. But I do want to um, thank you, Darren, so much for being so open and responding to such a very wide range of questions that were coming in from our audience and thank you very much to the audience for uh for for your questions that um i, I think have been challenging and and stimulating so um thank you very much um to everyone um if i can just uh, uh let you know that the next insights event will be on this thursday uh, the 21st of october uh, our black history month lecture warm words are not enough repaying the debt to our black heroes and that's beat marcus Ryder. so we hope we'll join you then and if i can close this evening uh by again just thanking uh, our speaker uh, darren henley chief executive of the arts council thank you very much and good night everyone thank you good night